Hi, I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. So timeless wisdom. And the focus this morning is on practicing spiritual persistence, practicing spiritual persistence. And I am going to be pulling from Psalm 30, 37. And to refresh your memory, the Psalms were actually songs. They were songs. And we find the Psalms in our Old Testament. And Jesus often referred to and quoted the Psalms. And in a way, you know, the Psalms were teachings and ideas and inspiration put in song. And it reminds me of the Dutch proverb, he who sings prays twice. And so these psalms, these songs were a way of really inspiring people, holding or helping people to hold themselves up during tough and difficult times. So I'm going to be um, picking parts of Psalm 37. It's a rather long one, and it's rather repetitive in places. It's a psalm, I think, of contrast. Contrasts of how to be and how not to be. How to be and how not to be. What to do and what not to do. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. So here we have a do this, but not do that, right? Contrasting. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now we're going to take a look in a bit at what that word Lord means to us in New Thought, what it means metaphysically and mystically. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. So here's the do this, and here's the promise. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways. Instead, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. A future awaits for those who seek peace. So I said to you that the focus this morning is on spiritual persistence. And I know that for those of us in metaphysics and the New Thought Movement, unity and science of the mind and heart, that sometimes we shy away a bit from the Bible, and I actually understand why we might. Certainly for some of us, we may have grown up in a religious tradition that looked at the Bible as the inerrant word of God or, or used it to beat us over the head, or there were things in it that we said, there's just no way that can be true. And so we threw the baby out with the bathwater, as the saying goes. But I want to suggest that we might have a little bit of healing work we need to do around that. I might suggest though, that when we approach the Bible through mystical eyes and see much of it mystically and metaphysically, we will find that there is tremendous wisdom in it. And that wisdom can help us today, right where we are, what we're dealing with. You know, we're in a very unusual, very difficult set of circumstances for us brought about by the, the condition of the pandemic. We are finding our lives turned upside down and having to have new ways of teaching and working and socializing and all of that. And I believe that spiritual persistence is something we really do need right now to make it through. Persistence is the idea that no matter what, I will not give up. No matter what, I will not give up. 
And so what are some of the hints from this psalm that we can take to help strengthen in ourselves this experience of persistence so that not only do we make it through, but we garner the blessings as a result of what we are moving through. So the first hint comes from the words, trust in the Lord and do good. Actually, if we really unpacked that and lived by that, that would be enough for quite a sustained period of practice. The idea of trusting, the idea of doing good or doing right. So trust in the Lord. I told you we would take a look at that word Lord. What we understand that to refer to metaphysically is law, divine law, spiritual law, spiritual principle. And so for us unpacking this mystically, it means to trust in divine law, to trust in divine law, to trust in spiritual principle, to trust in the outworking of that divine law, that as we are holding in consciousness, consciousness and practicing and living from that higher truth and lifting our vibration higher and higher, we will attract to us a life that is rich, a life that is filled with love and joy and peace and well-being. It is to have faith, to trust in the Lord, to trust in the law, is to have faith, to know that somehow, some way, things will work out. We have to do our part. We have to do our part. And we have to trust. We have to have mountain-moving faith. I remember learning of a story of a small church, a small church at the, in the hills of the Smoky Mountains. And this church had been willed a piece of land from a congregant who had passed on. And the land was to be used for building a new sanctuary. And so the congregation got busy and they built this new sanctuary and they were ready to dedicate it. And they had used every square inch of this small plot of land that they were given for their, for their new church. And only weeks before the dedication Sunday, they got word from the building inspector that they were not going to be allowed to open. And the reason they weren't going to be allowed to open is that they didn't have enough parking. They didn't have enough parking. And they were told that the only way they could open would be if they could expand their parking to meet the zoning requirements. Well, you see, the church had built its, had used every square inch of the land that they had been given, except for the mountain in the back yard of the church. They had built the church right to the edge of this, this foothill. Well, they had a problem, didn't they? They didn't have the money to get rid of that mountain and get some more land so that they could have expanded parking. So the pastor called the congregation together and said, we're going to have a prayer meeting tonight. And we, I need some mountain-moving, praying people from this congregation. And out of a congregation of 300, 24 people showed up that night. And he had them pray for three hours. You think sometimes New Thought Ministers go long? Three hours they were praying for mountain-moving faith. And when they were done, and the pastor said, okay, you can go home now, he said, and we will dedicate the church on time. Well, they thought, okay, well, we don't know how that's going to happen, but we prayed that the mountain would be moved, and we even prayed that God would somehow find a way that we would have the money for the parking lot. Well, the very next day, the pastor is in his office doing his work, and there's a knock on the door. And a man comes to the door wearing a construction hard hat, and hard hat, and he says, to the "Pastor, excuse me, but I work for Davis Construction Company over in the county behind your property, and we've got a problem. We are building a large shopping center, and we need some dirt fill, and we need it right away. We're stalled. We can't go on with our project. So we're wondering if we can buy some of that mountain, some of that dirt in your backyard, and, and we need it right away, and we will move it, and we will even pave the area for you if, we, if you need us to. What do you think of that? Mountain moving faith. I remember the first time I heard about that story, there was a caption to it, would you have shown up? Would you have been one of the 24 that had shown up that evening in the church to pray? You see, sometimes the, 
we confuse trusting in the outworking of the law in having to know the how that it's going to come about. And that trips us up a lot. We don't always have the knowledge to know the how in advance. And this is where the trust comes in. That if we are doing our part and always mindful of what our part is and always willing to be guided into what are our next steps, whether it is to to pray for three hours or to do something else, but to do whatever the guidance tells us to do, we will find that in time, the law will prove itself unto itself. Here's another hint. Do not worry about what others are doing or be envious of them. Oh, man, does that have practical applications for every one of us, right? Do you ever get tripped up in in worrying about where you are in your life, your career or your family dynamic or your, your social life? Do you ever worry about where you are compared to where others are? I think it's a very common human tendency. I also know that when I get myself stuck in that place, that when I am worrying about what others are doing or I'm envious because it seems like they are doing so much better in a certain area of their lives than I am, that that absolutely kills my joy. That I have to learn to stay in my own lane. That I have to be clear on what is mine to do, what am I, where have my life experiences led me, and how do I work the land I've been given, the spot on this planet in this time that I've been given, how do I work it the very best and not look at what somebody else is doing unless it is to inspire me to do better right where I am. You may have heard of the name Glenn Cunningham. He was, he won some uh, medals in the 1932 and 1936 Summer Olympics. But what you might not know about him is how his life began. When he was eight years old, he had a job of of keeping the little one-room schoolhouse warm. And so he would have to go to the schoolhouse early in the day to help put the, the fuel in the um, pot belly stove to keep the, the, sc- the classroom warm. And on this particular morning, there was a mix-up, and instead of kerosene, gasoline was put in the can, and it caused an enormous explosion, a fire in the school, and he was severely burned. Eight years old, all the flesh on his knees were burned, he lost all the toes on his left foot, the flesh on his shins were burned, and the doctors basically said, we're amazed that he's even alive, and he is likely, he, he will be a cripple for the rest of his life. And the doctors had said to, to Glenn's parents, we really think his leg should be amputated. And, he, and this little boy heard this and went crazy and did not want that to happen. And so his parents did not have his legs amputated. However, he was confined for a long time to a wheelchair, and the kind of therapy he had was some massage therapy and a little bit of physical therapy. And one day as he's in his wheelchair, his mother wheels him out to the backyard and to the beautiful sunshine. And I guess in his little heart and soul, he had had enough of being in confined in that wheelchair, and the story is that he threw himself out of the wheelchair and started to to crawl on the grass toward the, the fence in their yard. And he made it to the fence, and he pulled himself up to the fence, and slat by slat, drug himself along the whole edge of their backyard. And he continued to do this day after day after day after day, because all he wanted to do was be able to walk again. Two years after the explosion, he was able to walk again. But that wasn't enough for him. For you see, he wanted to do all he could with what he had left, right? And so he kept at it, and he kept at it, spiritual persistence and pure determination. And eventually, he built up enough strength that he was able to run. And those medals that he won in the 32 and the 36 Olympics were for running. 
were for running. One of his favorite scripture verses was from Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so we have to stop worrying about what we have lost and focus on what do we still have? And how are we going to stay in our own lane and really work and use what we still have? What we still have. That is to see our life circumstances through the eyes of spiritual persistence, to never, ever, ever give up. A third hint is to commit your way. Commit your way to the Lord. And of course, we know that means commit your way to the law. Stay diligent in your practice. Don't dabble in the truth. Stay committed in it. You've heard the expression, haven't you, in the breakfast of, of bacon, eggs, and milk. The chicken and the cow are involved, but the pig is committed. You know, it's like you don't dabble in this stuff. You really have to dig in and be committed. To be committed means you do it not just when you're in the mood, but you do it because you're building spiritual muscle. Too often we pull out our spiritual practice when all hell has broken loose in our lives. When we get the news from the doctor that we really have a serious health challenge, a serious health issue, or when our spouse says to us, you know, I've had it, I think, I think we're done, or when our, our finances are in such shambles because we've ignored them and haven't done what we've needed to do, then we start to go, oh, well, maybe I should start working with prayer. Maybe I really should start going back to church or reading spiritual books or finding a prayer partner or working with a mastermind group. And Certainly, that may get us going for a while, but I often wonder, what would it be like if we just could be willing to be disciplined enough to have the spiritual persistence to do the simple spiritual practices on a steady, regular basis? Would we find ourselves in such extreme situations in our lives? I'm not sure that we would. I'm not sure that we would. I think it's Oprah Winfrey who often says, you got to pay attention to the whispers in your life before they become a scream, right? Right? Commit your way. Practice. You already know what it is that you need to be practicing just as I do. The practice of meditation, the practice of forgiveness, the practice of gratitude, the practice of forgiving. We know these things. Blessed are you know. Blessed are you if you know these things, more blessed are you if you do them. Commitment. I heard an example of this this week that just really inspired me. New Wisconsin, there, was, there is a new Supreme Court justice to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Her name is Jill Karowoski. I think I'm saying her name somewhat close. Anyway, she was in the middle of a 100-mile ultramarathon when she was sworn in as a Supreme Court Justice. She was sworn in while she was running, and I think it was the 35th mile marker. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's commitment. And you see, we must trust the outcome of the application of principle, right? Another hint, be calm and patient. Be still is the word that's used in Psalm 37, be still and patient in the law. Be still and patient to center yourself, to know, all right, I might be in the middle of what seems like a plateau here. I keep working the principles. I keep doing what I know is mine to do, and I haven't had the breakthrough yet. But remember that quote from Thomas Edison that I shared a few moments ago? That so much of what passes as failure is the one who has stopped just short of success, just short of that last experiment that would have been the breakthrough or that last strike that would have broken apart the problem. So patience is such an important quality. And I know that it's, for some of us, myself included, it certainly doesn't seem to come naturally. 
I still find myself, at least I smile now instead of getting too frustrated about it, no matter what line I find myself in at Costco or any other store, I, it will always invariably be the slowest moving line. Now I know I must be affirming that into existence, but I also know that on one hand I keep praying that I can become a more calm and patient person no matter what no matter what. So the universe is saying to me, Wendy, here you go. Here's your chance to practice calmness. Here's your chance to practice patience. Another hint. Refrain from anger. Do what you know is yours to do. And though you stumble, you will not fall. Refrain from anger. Do what you know is yours to do. And though you may stumble, you're not going to fall. You might stumble, but you're not going to fall. Sometimes knowing what not to do can be as helpful as knowing what to do. I believe it was Meister Eckert who talked about the idea that our spiritual life and spiritual growth is much less a process of acquiring more. It is more a process of unlearning or releasing. Moving forward can be frustrating. There are going to be times that things seem to, to just be stalled or people are thwarting your plans or there are obstacles or the building department says you don't have enough parking or whatever the situation may be. But to, but to refrain from being angry about it, to do what is ours to do and to know that though we may be stumbling along part of the way, we can get back up again. We can get back up again, and there's another step yet for us to take. And the last hint that I would share with you is this one. In the psalm, we are told, turn from evil and do good. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. So there is, again, an action, as there is with so many of the hints I've shared from this particular psalm. There is an action of what to do or what not to do, and then the promise of something good that will follow, right? So turn from evil and do good. I, I struggle a little bit with some of the language in this psalm and some of the language um, in the Old Testament itself because it can seem so black and white and so much of life is really nuanced, right? So to me, the idea of turning from evil and doing good is to turn away from that which is negative or that which is not life-sustaining or life-affirming and to be very mindful of where I place my attention, where I place my energy and my focus. And when I do, when I can turn away from that which pulls me down, when I can turn away from that which is critical or judgmental and focus on that which lifts my energy and lifts my spirits and lifts my vibration, I find that I really am dwelling in a completely different realm. And so the practice includes knowing what we are paying attention to, keeping our attention high, keeping our thoughts high, keeping our vibration high, the fulfillment of our dreams, whatever we are dreaming of, whatever we are longing for, lies on the other side of the practice of spiritual persistence. And so I hope there has been an idea or two that you've heard or that has been triggered in your mind that you can say, ah, yes, I resonate with that and I had forgotten that. I'm going to remember that now, whether I have to put it on a sticky note and stick it on my computer monitor or put it as a screensaver or put it on my refrigerator. I'm going to choose to remember. And in choosing to remember, I know I can be more spiritually persistent. Namaste. Namaste.